Snow here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com, the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics and strategies to grow your strength training business. This is episode 332 and I'm joined by Vital Exercise owner, Ted Harrison. Ted, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Nice to see you. So likewise, it's great to be able to speak to you without Poor, being you know drenched in sweat, which uh, we attempted to do this podcast before. Um, quick funny story: I was it was very hot in Ireland. There was a heat wave. It was also hot in the UK. Um, but I I'm up in the office attic, and uh, my laptop was overheating so much that that Ted was helping me build a kind of makeshift air conditioning system with ice cubes and a fan, which failed. And so here we are <laughs> re-recording, which is which is absolutely fine because I, well, it's fine for me, Ted, because frankly, I just enjoy our conversation. So I'm happy to chat yeah, again. Me too. Yeah. Um, and, and I wanted to just start off by doing a little bit of a business profile on you. I know we've probably talked about this stuff in the past, but, and if, if, if we're repeating ourselves, so be it, but I can't remember all the details. So remind me, what? let's talk about your business firstly, so people have an understanding of, of, of how you do things. So just give a little overview of Vital Exercise and your services. Um, <clears throat> my first commercial gym was in the early 80s. I had a Nautilus Fitness Center too, actually, um, and trained people uh, out of there for uh, close to five years. And then uh, started I came out of that, sold that business and went working for my family business. But while I was doing that, <clears throat> I was lucky enough always to have a very good garage gym, you know, with Nautilus equipment and um, various free weights and dumbbells and cables and what have you in different houses as I moved around. Um, so I always trained people out of there too um, until I moved to uh, a new town, uh, which is about 30 miles from where I, where I originally uh, grew up. And then after I sort of went into a sort of semi-retirement for a while. And then um, in 2012, I believe, I started Vital Exercise, which was a uh, boutique style gym, for want of a better word, which was about 370 square feet, which is like an average size living room. Um, and got myself a very good deal on seven Nautilus Nitro machines uh, and had a very clinical looking environment. Um, also had a, a, a um, Airdyne bike in there and a chin up and dip uh, unit <clears throat> and opened up <clears throat> with no real advertising uh, and just um, worked it from there. Started off um, doing free workouts, maybe three or five a week. Just used to go do them, come home, do other stuff. <clears throat> and over the course of that five or six years, built the business up until it was doing about 35, 40 workouts a week, and then moved to a larger location, probably twice the size, about three or four years ago, bought more equipment, um, expanded our... Ted, let me gone. pause you there, because I'm, I'm so fascinated to talk to you about something there. So 370 square feet, seven Nautilus machines. Now... This is interesting to me because in our studio, we have we have six medics, lumbar, big five, and we have hammer leg extension, and we have uh, power block dumbbells, and we're in the, the you know, we still need to build a, a bench and, and a few other bits as well, but we don't have a lot of stuff, right? Now, some people might hear that and say, you got six medics machines, what are you complaining about? And that is true. Um, but when I when I think of obviously a lot of our colleagues who have, you know, 15, 20 machines, I think, you know, there's so much variety you can offer. So I'd love to hear in such a small space with just seven machines, what did you do? If you could, I don't know, like, yeah, I'm not going to give you any sort of structure, but um, what, how did you manage to keep clients engaged in terms of the workout programming when you've got such, you know, so few pieces, you just speak on that for a bit. Well, you saw the, the unit you, you've been down and was oh, it that and, unit? Uh, was it? Okay. The, right. That was the original yeah. one. Yeah. Where you came down and had a workout. Uh, and the answer to your question, um, you will know yourself the, the concept of it is because I vary the workouts very much um, um, rather than um going from you know machine to machine and and covering the full body in five or six uh, exercises um i do do that but 
we we changed it around so that no two workouts were exactly the same. We would, for instance, uh, this is a lot of the the way I do it now is we would do a leg press, a chest press, a pull down, and then jump on the Airdyne bike for maybe a minute or two minutes, and then repeat that three times. It's kind of it it sort of harks back to uh, Matt Brzezaki's uh, three times three approach. You know, there's nothing new in, in this game. And uh, he was uh, one of the originators of that style of training. I'm not getting off topic, just topic, but just to sort of take you back. And also Ellington Darden wrote a, a very good book, uh, Conditioning for Football, I think it was called. And he recommended also that, that style of training. This was chin-ups and dips running between two uh, stations. I think you do chin ups, dips, run 50 meters or something like that, and then repeat back and forward. So it's that metabolic conditioning style, uh, for want of a better um, um, terminology. And and we we did that, and no two workouts were the same, you know. And then I would change things around. Maybe we do do uh, um, a chest press or overhead press and row, and then I'd have them do. Um, bike again and nowadays it's something like a ski erg or um a, a walker hit mill holding weights or pushing prowling that kind of thing and then maybe a next the next session will be a standard circuit one set to failure um or six times six um, one of my mentors vince garonda he taught me that so you know it's, we vary that's how we keep them engaged and one of the feedbacks that the rain and i get a lot is that they love our clients love the fact that no two workouts are the same. And it is a rarity within a six month period to have the same workout. That's fascinating. So what, even, even now you follow that same principle yeah. of training. Yes. And does that mean, does that mean that even when they start, even in their first four workouts, each one of those workouts is different? Um, we have the initial consultation session, yeah. and then from there, we will bring them in, get seat positions, a starting weight, and those kind of training sessions for the first two or three are very standard leg press, chest press, pull over, uh, pull down, you know, lateral raise, overhead press, something like that. And we'll just take them through, find out any physical limitations, any psychological problems we might have uh, with, with exercise uh, intensity, avoidance and stuff. And we take the first couple of workouts from there and then maybe finish the workout with the echo bike or the ski erg a very um, reduced intensity so that they they can always carry on a conversation uh, after the uh, exercise and from there after maybe four workouts then we'll start build putting them on the vital exercise style of training yeah and then from there it's like every workout's different yes do you find that how do you like measure progress then? Because obviously if everything's different, then the numbers from one workout to the next aren't that meaningful, right? So in terms of, yes. I mean, I don't mean meaningful. I mean, like you can't compare when measuring progress. Do you do like a check-in workout every so often just to see gauge how people are doing or what's your thoughts around that? Uh, a few different ways of doing that. We do have a strength test uh, occasionally. Uh, maybe once every three months we'll do a strength test, you know, maximum repetitions with a certain amount of weight. Uh, clients who want to perform a chin up, you know, we're trying to get them chinning. That will be a test how many they could do. Um, and providing if after you've been training a client for six months to a year, because we use charts. I mean, we, we chart uh, every, every workout is charted from the whiteboard to a paper chart. Uh, in, in, and our charts are very standard high intensity you know, blocks, exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weights. And it's you, all done. On, you, you use a whiteboard. Sorry, I know I keep button in. This is just how it's going to go, Ted. So, so you use a whiteboard during the workout. We use it. We, we write the, um, well, anyway, just go to one sorry, step back. Sorry, Ted. That's, so that's how um, you can gauge progress with strength. And also, um, we also use density training. So we will do several sets of one exercise at a set weight. And we would say, begin them at 30 seconds rest and then taper that down to 10 seconds rest, which raises the intensity and is another form of progression. So that's another way we would do it. And there's probably multiple ways I, I couldn't think of now, but there's a lot that, that we can measure their progress. And I know that if a client's been coming to me for a year, then um, I've got a good idea, you know, intuitively, in my consciousness, what that person can do. And I know how much, when I should test them, 
we don't use uh, in maximum intensity one set to failure as a be all and end all gauge, and we also don't use maximum weights as a be all and end all gauge. There are many factors in this um, spectrum of training which represents uh, a forward step, and we gauge that in different avenues as we as we go on. Yeah, yeah. So no, that's super interesting. So no, I was just curious. So during a session, you'll you'll mark you'll track them on the whiteboard and then transfer that to paper at the end yes. of the session. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I like in that. yeah, because um, I have a very eclectic mind as far as exercise, not a necessarily a clever one, but quite eclectic, and and I'm not dogmatic about how I train. Other other than the, the workouts should be brief. I, I believe in that, and none of our workouts last much longer than 25 minutes. You know, 20 being the average whole session. You know, we may we may do some rotator cuff work and and specific lower back work and stuff, which will draw it out to 45. But the meat of the workout, the main meal of the workout is usually about 20, 25 minutes. Um, so the reason for the what the whiteboard is I like the concept of having um, the client come in and make contact with what they've got to do. Clients like to talk. We all have, we engage and have a little chat when they come in. But there's the workout, and it narrows the focus. And it's a and it's another. There are some very very good principles um, that uh, CrossFit um, brought to the fore. Community being one of them. You know, working from a whiteboard, not necessarily the generic wad. Although we do do that. We may put a, a workout of the day up, but it's all my style. It's not. There's no ballistic movements there's no weightlifting but the principle of using that we we could do that for certain clients that are capable of working at a certain degree of intensity we will have a standard workout maybe once a week that all those hand-picked clients will do um, and the others won't but we write the workout down maybe if there's two people training it'll be two different workouts or if there's a two people training separately or together it'll be one so two people separately would be two workouts and then a couple might come in and we train them together and it's one workout written on the board. And then after they finish, we, we're noting on the whiteboard as the workouts are progressing, Lorraine is using a marker, I'm using a marker, and we're writing down different um, uh, annotations of where this workout is going and what the clients are doing. And then at the end of the workout, they leave and after we've done our uh, cleanup, We'll then look at the whiteboard and put that down on that client's individual um, sheet. And then it goes in their folder and, and, and we have many, many uh, workouts logged. A follow-up question on that. So if you've got two people and they do the same workout, they do it in the same order. Does one have to wait for the other to do the first exercise before they can do it? So then that doesn't that lag the time a little bit? No, because um, okay. you start one ahead of the other. You would, we're, there's two trainers on the floor, myself and Lorraine. We have no staff at the moment. It's just us yeah. two. So the Lorraine would be, for, say, if it's a man and a woman, Lorraine is responsible for the lady and I am responsible for the gentleman. Um, and as the workout progresses, weights are changed, seat positions are changed as the clients go around. So say the lady may start with 300 metres on the ski erg come off of there and the gentleman comes on and begins his 300 meters while the lady is doing a chest press and a leg press, mm -hmm. right? Okay. When the lady okay. finishes that circuit, she rests until the gentleman finishes his and then she picks it up and says she might do three rounds. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Just on the circuits, I'm assuming that if they're doing three rounds, are they going to muscle failure in the first round or is that unlikely? They're think? just working hard. Okay. So what a couple reps yeah. shy of failure probably. That yes. The, the, yeah. yeah. They, or, or or a failure, depending okay. on how I've set the weight, Fair depending enough. on how hard the workout wants to be. Depending on I the individual say, as well, right? Indeed. Yeah. And, and many, many times the workout, the, the, the exercise, maybe on the second or third round will bog down and stop. And yeah. we just instruct them, take a few deep breaths, rotate the shoulders, retract the shoulder blades slightly and go again. And then they'll chip away until those repetition, the required repetitions are performed. Mm -hmm. Got it. So... I was going to come on to this later, but I think it's actually probably good timing now since we're kind of talking about it. I'm fascinated by, um, obviously, I, I love I love the business model of high intensity training because you can 
you can you know generate good revenue um, and provide a really valuable service in such a time efficient way. And um, so that's why most of us do thirty minute sessions, and obviously there are some that do. There's a couple that do fifteen minute sessions, and. I think that's incredible that they can squeeze clients into 15 minutes because it's not easy in terms of getting everything done right, in terms of making sure the small talk is kept to a minimum <laughs> um, and making sure that you've got time to wipe down machines and uh, and have a little bit of like, you. because I, I do think it's important to have some time in there where you're always educating them a little bit, right? Now, your sessions are 30 minutes, right? Is that correct? The actual slot that they pay for is 30 minutes, even though it's 20 if, minute if- work, or is that incorrect? Well, it, it's a human being, as you say. First of all, you have talking sometimes you run over and a client's five minutes late. Yesterday, yeah. we had a gentleman. I'm helping a gentleman who's had three brain surgeries at the moment. He can hardly oh, wow. walk, hardly talk. So he takes an hour, right? We was booked in at 45 uh, minutes, but yesterday he was particularly poorly and his session took an hour. So two, the client rolled, the, the next client was outside waiting for 15 minutes. She understands the situation. We we text the following client to say we're running late, and 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 it okay. it works very you know spare of the moment in in, in green. But it does. We try and keep the sessions to client walking in, client walking out to under forty five minutes. Yeah, you know. Okay. okay. Does that but but no, that's fine. But and in terms of like scheduling it, do they are they all in half hour slots? But then obviously there's there's scope for flexibility in there as you just described. Is that how it yeah, works basically? But yes, because yeah. client A likes to come in, look at the whiteboard, and get on with it. Client B and he's he's in and out in under 30 minutes. Client B wants to come in, put off the training, talk about their holiday, talk about various issues they've got with their kids. And whatever's and going on, get out. <laughs> yeah. And then it's okay. Let's start. There's the whiteboard. Let's let's move it on now. But it's a people business too. This is a business, a people business. People come to you because um, they want to they want to have a an experience. They come. They like myself and Lorraine. Hopefully, they like a chat. We talk about restaurants and things, and then we move it forward. It's a, it's a part of their day. A lot of people we we train are retired. You know, they're in their seventies. Um, maybe forty percent of the people that we work with are over over seventy, um, and then we have the young bucks too. But that's the point. We know, okay. So if client A wants a session, we know that's thirty minutes. Most we need with with clean down and everything. If client B books it, we make a longer slot, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's how we work. We 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 know who these people are, and after a few workouts with a new client. We know how long that's going to take, but we try to cap it at 45 minutes. Yeah. Now, this is so interesting. So, because it's definitely something, I mean, I, at the start, I struggled to complete workouts on time. And there was instances where I had to omit an exercise um, because personally for me, I mean, it's slightly different because you've got a chap who's got, you know, free brain surgeries like that is a very special case. But for me, um, I never want to infringe on a paying client's next session. So I will, if 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 necessary, and it's usually the client's fault because they're talking too much. I will cut. The, well, that's on cut. them. It is on that's them. That's on them, them, not and you. I, no, exactly. And so I will always make sure that the next client starts on time, and that's kind of my new philosophy. However, as trainers, we should be. Again, this is my opinion. Um, you know, we should program the workout and manage the whole session so that it does end on time and the client has an amazing experience, right? And I yeah. think I'm I've got so much better, and obviously practice is everything, right? The more you do it. And at the start, I was like, oh, you know, I was running over and um I wasn't getting certain things done during the session that were important and it was stressful, right? And now I, you know, I have a block of I think it's eight sessions on a Tuesday evening. And, um, and I can just, you know, I can just make sure everyone gets a great workout in no one's running over. And it's because I've, I've practiced and I've got a, a system down that I'm used to delivering on time. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think some of that you just learn over time. And then obviously you try and, well, I think you, you create that process so that, you know, when you hire a trainer that they can achieve the same thing, but again, it's going to take some practice for people, but I'm just curious, you know, what, what have you found for you works well to, keep things kind of on time a little i don't know if you've got any little tips just from your years of experience like you know when a client's going off on one chatting 
right? Do you have any any like tips on what you might do to cut the conversation short without being rude or any other things that come to mind that help you keep sessions on time? If I'm talking to a client and the client is obviously taking too long, I will simply do this. <laughs> yeah, just tap the watch and point at the whiteboard. We need to get on. Yeah, but you do it in a way that allows, you know, because if you go from someone talking sincerely about a problem that they have in their life and I'm and they were asking my advice about a certain issue, which is far out of my remit as a personal trainer, I'm not going to go, oh, hang on now, let's get on with it. You know, it depends, again, on the circumstance. But if, they talk, if they're talking to me uh, and you wait for a natural gap in the conversation and just go like this, we need to get on. It's a shared thing, right? Now, come on now. No, it's we need to get on. Yeah, you need right? to get your money's worth right here. You know, that's it's, right. You're, you're doing it. You're, 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 you're doing in, the, in, their, in their best interest. Sorry. That's right. It's not that. about yeah, so, me. That's about yeah. them. So yeah. for anyone listening to this, if they didn't see what, what Ted did, basically he raises his wrist and points at his watch and appropriate time during a conversation. Like, come on, we're, we're running out of time here, which I think is really, it's quite subtle, but effective. I think that's a good idea. Is there anything yeah. else that comes to mind for you? Um, I don't know, like, you know, I remember Luke saying to me that they always keep kind of the time under tension within a certain range. So as to not be on a, if you're on a leg press for 40 reps, that's going to consume a lot of time unnecessarily, perhaps, right? Is one yeah. thing. So how, is there anything like that that comes to mind for you that you might stick to in order to keep, keep the workout efficient? To keep the workout very efficient, we often use a clock. We have a road clock, um, which is another great CrossFit <laughs> accoutrement. <laughs> so we have that on the stand so if i need to push things along uh and uh, i want to i want to give them a kick-ass workout excuse my french then we put the clock on and we have say um three minutes on and one minute off and we will start them on a chest press for 12 reps and a pull down for say 15 and then they will jump on the bike or the ski erg or the walker and we'll use up the rest of the time at a specific cadence until the duration of the first three minutes is up. They rest exactly one minute and they start again, either on the same or different exercises. And they do five rounds of that. Okay. So it's timed, which is yeah, going to speed up the whole process, isn't it? That's, that, that's, that's it. And that, and that could, that could be, I'm sure with a little thought, it could be um, utilized for time under tension, you know, uh, type training doing it by the clock you just run it for a minute and uh, select a correct resistance and the um, the individual will continue until he either reached the end whether it's muscular failure or not or if he does reach muscular failure before the clock first minute whatever the, the time bracket is he simply maintains tension on the handles which is a, a, a wonderful um uh, Doug Holland, bit of advice, which uh, Doug McGuff has spoke about. You just maintain tension on the handles, uh, holding a semi-contracted state until the clock runs out. Then you'd have a 30-second gap or a 15-second gap programmed in on the clock to the next exercise and on you go. Because the, because the clock is then the arbitrator, not you. That's telling them what to do. You're not the bad guy trying to force this workout it's the type of workout that is necessitated by the time allowed left to you by the client's constant talking. So you could do that. And it's also a good workout in its own right. You know, we don't just do it for, for reasons of getting them in and out. It's just a great workout. Yeah. Those are some great tips. You know, when I listen to that you clock about- is an essential purchase. It's brilliant. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's hands, you know, it's with a remote control. Once you've got the, you know, I'm an old man, so it took me a while to figure it out. But once you can do that, it's a wonderful thing. It has multiple applications. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. And it, it, I never before have I been so time conscious. I mean, I am I am this the type of guy who's run by his calendar, but I'm not one to wear a watch and look at it every five seconds. But when training clients, I have to. I have to have be always so tuned into exactly what time it is and how much time we have left. Um, and by the way, Ted, I think this is the first time anyone's talked about CrossFit in a positive light on this podcast. <laughs> Episode 332. 
Well, you um, see, CrossFit is a concept. It's not a religion. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, no, I. I but you're, you're the things you said that you like about it. I, I completely agree with. And yeah, I think isn't it? Isn't it? Is Doug? Because Doug used to have. So Dr. Doug McGuff had the blog bodybyscience.net, which I don't think is no longer around. Um, which I think is no longer around, I should say. And he used to talk about workout of the week, right? Wow, which was a, a play on CrossFit's workout of the day. Am I right about yeah. that? Is that where that's a comes derivative? From? I believe so. Yes. Just I don't derivative. know if there was someone who did it before CrossFit and before Doug. I wasn't sure. I just remember hmm. that. And He's, he understands, just, he right. understands it, man. He, underst- he understands yeah. that, Doug McGuff. He, he understands the good and the bad. And as I do, yeah. I never put myself on the same level as him, but I understand the good and the bad. And when people now say to me, what kind of training is it? I say, think of it's like CrossFit without the injuries. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, because of the intensity, right? That's, That's right. Funny. But let I me mean, look, they've got, some, they've got something right in terms of the community, um, in terms of finding something that, you know, it's, it's not, I don't think it's priced as high as like high end personal training, but it's not cheap. And so no. there's, there's something there that people are really willing to invest in. So yeah, it's, um, I don't, I think it's, it's short sighted to just think, Oh, CrossFit's a load of, load of crap. There's nothing we can learn from that. There is, there is stuff we can take from that and other fitness modalities that we don't agree with and, and take into our evidence-based practice, yeah. right? That's, that's how Absolutely. we do it. Um, I mean, the hit guys ahead. have been doing a version of CrossFit, before CrossFit was even in, before Glassman retired from gymnastics or whatever he used to do. Ellington Darden and Matt Brzezaki had CrossFit style, CrossFit style workouts, you know, in the 70s, man. So the, this is nothing new. It's just a name. You know, I'm not going to close my eyes to anything. I think doing Olympic lifting for repetitions is insanity. I think Olympic lifting is the best Olympic, that and wrestling is the most fantastic Olympic sports. I don't like doing them, and I certainly wouldn't recommend to my clients. A kipping pull-up, again, is, in my view, insanity. But a slow, controlled chin-up followed by an echo bike is not. It's good. So straight line, linear mov- movements, no very, very minimal skill um, done at a high level of work, high level intensity, uh, maintaining a high heart rate throughout, allowing it to dip down and come back up again sometimes. It's just exercise. Everyone's branding everything, man. It's just exercise. And you have to be, I've been doing this for 40 years. I know what I'm doing. Because if I don't, I haven't been paying attention. So I I do know what I'm doing. I'm like a good chef. I know what I'm doing. I know the ingredients. And I know if there's a new vegetable, because my colleagues don't like it, I don't care if it tastes good. I'm picking it and serving it. And that's what I do in my business. I don't care about the labels. I know you don't. I love that. I love that about you. Um, I love your uniqueness in that sense. Um, let's let's just talk about the ski erg and the is it the bike you said you have? Right? We have there's, it's just yeah. a fan bike, it's an echo bike, it's just a okay. very good rogue echo bike now. So I'm just I'm I'm interested in the program in there because obviously as as we know in 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 our industry, um, <clears throat> you know, the heart rate, doing strength training, heart rate doesn't go up quite so high as it would if you're sprinting or riding a bike really hard, um, simply because you're increasing the stroke volume because the muscular contraction is that much harder, right? So cardiac yeah. output is still really high, but the heart rate's lower. Now, as well as providing some variety, which you've already mentioned, is it that you incorporate those modalities because the client just wants to have a high heart rate? right? They want to feel what it's like to have a high heart rate in their workout. Or do you think there is, so there's a sensation thing there and that's totally legit. I do a lot in our studio as do many of our colleagues that might not deliver any additional physiological benefit, but it keeps people engaged and it keeps people adhering to one of the most important habits they can possibly do in their entire life. Right. And that is a good thing. And that is that, that there. And I know you totally agree with me on this. Because probably partly inspired by you, Ted, and um, that there is is something which I think a lot of our industry struggle with is prepare is 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 the willingness to do things that aren't you know completely evidence based, um, and 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 maybe and maybe in some cases redundant, but are really important for that that stickiness aspect. Uh, and so long as they're not unsafe, that should be okay in my opinion. So. With that said, is that kind of the main reason for having those medallies is that is the novelty and the sensation of having a high heart rate, or is there something else as well? <clears throat> we depending on the client, you know, we we have say an 87-year-old woman. 
she will go on that bike, but her heart rate will remain very low because we will insist upon a certain low cadence. She's getting exercise for her legs uh, in between doing uh, a weight machine, doing one of the Nautilus machines. She will do that. It, it, it maintains a steady heart rate, which is good for uh, a multitude of internal metabolic reasons, right? Stroke volume being one of them. Um, it, another client may come in. Uh, we have a 55-year-old gentleman who is close to being a, um, a professional athlete with his level of conditioning, and he'll do it differently, and he'll go hard on that. So that experience, <clears throat> it's never the goal to provide that feeling. That feeling is, a, is a ancillary. It's a byproduct of the workout itself. One of the things that I like very much about Dr. Ken Dr. Ken Leisner was his insistence on just hard work. You know, he did a lot of stuff now looking at videos, which were a little bit, the form was a little bit, not what we'd all thought it might have been, but the guy's a genius. And he just, you know, he would have people punching uh, the punching dummy, farmers walking because it's a great full body exercise. And I just extrapolate on that kind of thing because it's hard. That's why. Right, because you'll work hard on a chest press or a pullover, you work hard on a single arm row, and then you do a ski erg, and it's hard. It's just hard work, and it conditions people mentally and physically, depending on the client, and provides a great experience of hard physical work. Yeah, and I don't believe it's redundant because in terms of what the, these ex old exercise modalities, because I have people, very strong and conditioned people in this industry who come down to train with me, and I train like this. Now, a specificity is an issue. However, the basic conditioning is not. And when they follow me around these workouts, they're gassed after one and a half rounds. And I'm 20 years older then, and I'm moving around, and I'm, I'm in great shape. And I've got people that can kick my ass, believe me. So it's just good. It conditions the whole system and it just works and it's hard work. Yeah. Fair play. Interesting stuff. So just getting back to the profile, because I want to make sure I cover some more of this. So you, you always do private only, right? So you won't have anyone else. So you have the couple in there and the next client or couple are not in the studio, right? So it's always private environment. Yes. So we either do one-on-one on one or two, or it's, it's the size of it, really. So it's either one-on-one on one or a, either a, a man and, a, say, a husband and wife or two friends that know each other or something like that. Um, so why is – what's always a question? Yeah, sorry, I, I cut, cut you off, but I was just curious why you decide to do that for your business, why you kept it private. I mean, maybe it's like you say, it's just a size, and maybe that's it, but just curious. Yeah, I think the uh, – I always goes a lot of I've took a lot of advice just reading his, his uh, material and watching his YouTube stuff. And years ago, Dr. Doug, I mean, that was his, you know, ultimate exercise. I love that mm -hmm. concept. And I read somewhere, I don't know if I could ever find it again. One of, uh, I think it was on the ultimate exercise site. He said, if he could, I'm paraphrasing, I don't understand, I don't remember the words, but it said something like, if he could do it again, he would do it in a, a unit of about 300 and 50 to 400 square feet because that's really all you need. And I thought, you know, that's a, that's such a great idea. And at the time I had just bought these exercise machines and they were stored in a friend's garage and I had no idea what I was going to do with them. Just, they were very cheap and I was looking for something to do. So the two just melded together. I, I, I drove up the road there a mile and a half parked in this little beautiful industrial unit, a center of old farm buildings there was one for for, uh, for lease, and it was three hundred and fifty. I think it's three fifty or three seventy. So I went, I'll take it, you know, and that was it. So and and he was absolutely right. So the size of the premises dictated the amount of people I could train. Yeah, I, do you know what? I bet you, I bet you, Doug goes back on that now. And do you know why? Because he's now got well, it's his, he's had this for a while now. He's got his medical grade. Medex, uh, neck, four way neck, and lumbar extension. Yeah, and there's no way you can fit that in, in no. as well as all the other stuff he's got. So, you, the only yeah. thing, I mean, 
we, we could we could obviously debate and there's probably a few limitations but one of them is you can only have so many machines right and if you love machines yeah. that's the problem <laughs> well this is the issue that i always talk to my friends peter and brian collins and um and they got a lovely you know, space, haven't they? Well, the, yeah. you know, they, they never stop getting this. I mean, they've got the finest gym in the UK, no way. I must get no them on the podcast at some they, point. Yeah, they go, they're great guys, and they really know their stuff. And um, and I'm sure Doug's the same. We get this stuff because we want to use it. You know, we like to train on it. I'm sure when your medic stuff was, when it arrived, you get the clients out of the way, I want to use it, right? <laughs> so that's what it's like. And that's why we're now moving to a second location. We're going to have two gyms. and but. I've gone from 350 to I think 550. And now this next one will be best part of 2000 square feet. Amazing. So that's going to be so awesome. So it's that again for more equipment and we get bored. I mean, you get bored doing, so it's good to get new stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I'm excited to see it and I am going to come over Ted. I promise you I'm at right. a very busy stage of my life, right. With, with business and with a 19 month, 19, 20 months. I can't remember. Uh, old son, you know, you're almost, he's yes. almost two. That's, that's how you say it. Yes, um, and then another, another coming along next month. And so I'm just, I'm just accepting the fact that the next few years travel is going to be incredibly limited and that's okay. But then after that, Ted, I'm going to be there. And by then you'll probably have like 30 pieces in there. So it'd be great. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, let me just see. There's a couple of things I wanted to ask you. How many sessions are you doing now? Like per, per week? I'm just, I wanted to ask you this because I was talking to a mutual friend recently and he was like, I just love to hear what, you know, what other business owners are doing because obviously we're all different. Some of us want to do a Doug Holland. Some of us want to do 120 sessions a week and that's, that's fine. I would probably be the other end of the spectrum. I probably want to do much fewer sessions and more of the strategic business stuff. You know, my, I want to focus on my strengths, which are probably, you know, sales and marketing and strategy. I think I'm pretty good at the personal training, but it's just not something that I, I don't aspire to do like hundred plus sessions a week or anything like that. So what's your, what, how many sessions do you do and how do you see that changing going forward? Or how has that well, changed over time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we start, we open very early. We, we open at seven o'clock in the morning um, and we generally take an hour and a half um, break for lunch. We close Wednesday. This gives you some context. We close Wednesday afternoon and we work Saturday morning, uh, have Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday off. So it's two, we have two, you know, days off but broken up. Um, and a good week, we would probably, and it's just Lorraine and myself, a good week, we would probably do close to 70 sessions and, and a not so good week, um, maybe 55. That's good, bro, right? Mm. That's a good number. Bear in mind, size, did you? yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm 60, so, you know, I'm not, I'm in good shape, I'm fine, but it's still getting up because to, to get to work for seven o'clock in the morning, you've got to get up at five o'clock in the morning. You know, if, if you want to be ready and, and read and, you know, and take your time and get the body moving. So it's, you know, that means we're in bed at, you know, no later than 9.30 and we're up at five. So the hours are a lot. And I know that I could be pushing 80 sessions a week if we work later in the evening because we close at six. Uh, we may finish work at 6.30, but we close at six. But by that time, we've been in the gym at seven in the morning till 6.30 at night and only had an hour and a half off. So it's a long day. Um, but we know that if we did Saturday afternoon and we get so many inquiries for people who want to do training after work, that it would be very easy to push those sessions. Well, to, to you know, 80, 90, 100 sessions a week, it could be done over time. But um, I don't want to do that because it's just too much. And that's why with the new gym, we have, we have both the gyms open at the same time, the smaller one and the much larger one. It's going to put us in a position where we will have to have staff. You know, we have to have trainers. So because an, another issue is when you're, as you know, right, when you are a single operation and I'm the lead trainer, if I get ill, if anything happens to me, it's like when I tore my Achilles tendon, I'm supposed to be laid on the settee for, for six weeks. But the, the day after it happened with a soft cast on, I'm bouncing around in the gym on one leg trying to keep my business open. Well, you can't keep that going forever. 
So I need to grow because I need to grow. I need staff to help me out, you know, because you just, you know, one week off for a year, you know, it's too much. That single point of failure thing is a real issue, definitely, when you're the only trainer as well. As you say, it's, well, I know you've got your wife as well, but it's, um, this was way, way back before she was getting involved. Is that, was that accurate? Yeah. 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 It's, it's, um, I've got a really good, uh, similar situation. Oh, it's not similar, but it's, it's the same problem exists, which is, it's primarily just me at the moment. Right. Um, and obviously I have a business partner, but he doesn't do any of the training currently or very little of it. Um, and so we are actually, it's funny because we're nowhere near a capacity. We are growing, but we've realized that this is going to be a bottleneck because we've obviously got, so it's, it's not necessarily to cover me if I'm sick, which is obviously an additional benefit, which you've just brought to my attention, but it's more, if we actually want to grow, we need to hire, um, trainers sooner rather than later, even though we're not at capacity. Cause once once you free me up, then I'm just going to probably do all the free intros and probably grow the business that much faster. So we're in the process of trying to, um, you know, recruit recruit candidates and take them for a process. And one of the other issues is I'm about to have a baby uh, late October, and so I'm probably going to be off for a few weeks. And obviously, worst case scenario, depending on how things go regarding the birth, that could be extended, right? So fortunately, we've managed to sub in a friend of mine from Dublin who's actually going to help us with the training. He's an incredible trainer and he's a hit trainer, right? Which is just perfect. But if it wasn't for him, I don't know how we would manage that. I mean, there's a few ideas where maybe I would maybe I would um, batch all of the sessions in like a couple of days, but it would be really hard to do and very stressful. And so, yeah, these events have really made that clear to me that you've got to have a plan in place to figure out what you're going to do in terms of getting help or you know, figuring out how you're going to um, get through these kinds of issues. And so that's a really good point. So going back, going back to you, Ted, enough about me um, and your business can you just just so the the, the listeners um, understand and, and obviously you got to remember there are there are you know, listeners in all around the world the UK the US budding entrepreneurs people I mean I speak to people every day who are looking to start a strength training studio somewhere and it's quite a few of them in the UK actually so this is really helpful to them so with that in mind what are you what are you charging for your training as, as well what are you, what are your sort of what's your pricing and packaging what, what does that look like we charge uh, thirty five pounds. Uh, for a per session and if you are two people coming together uh, it is 30 pound a session so two people come in will be 60 pounds and uh, one person will be 35 and then we have various packages um, where we give free workouts if you buy 12 you know you say you buy six there's no discount if you buy 12 you get a free workout if you buy 24, you get three work, three free workouts. Lorraine houses a side of the business, thankfully. But that's basically <laughs> how that's <laughs> that's how it works. We um we 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 charge that. I think we're fairly priced for the couples workouts and very underpriced for the uh, individual workouts. I think people okay. don't have, and I think people bearing in mind that we have a private environment with air conditioning with some of the best equipment in the world with Nautilus Nitro is very very good exercise equipment it's probably the last real decent Nautilus line um, along and not to mention with, your expertise <laughs> well that's it and that's what I say to people well, you're buying 40 years of experience you know he's not buying 30 minutes because people do say to me I want my money's worth you know and I said you're getting it that's me right and you're in this and I think a lot of people that come to there's two points here. A lot of people that come to somewhere like uh, good studios like yourself and Luke's and that, maybe not Luke, I don't know, because it's a different country, but certainly in the UK, a lot of people come into our studios and they don't appreciate what they're getting. They don't value it because they don't understand it. But if they go to a big box gym or they go to fitness first or they go to, I'm sorry, but to drop that name, but say they go to, to a you know, mega busy studio and hook up with a 20 year old trainer who's only interested in his biceps and himself, then they'll try and have that, you know, with everyone running around with the whole self-consciousness and the mirrors try and, and, and that young man is charging the same as me, 35 pounds. Then People need to understand that when you walk into Lawrence Neal's MedEx studio and you're alone, 
right, with him to be trained one-on-one. There are many places where they were doing this in around the globe that 35 pound a session would be laughed at because it is hugely underpriced. But having said that, it's a solid business model and it works. And you, I think it's very important to do the, the group sessions, the doubles, and in our new studio up to four or five, because that's, that's, that's a much more greater earning potential. But as a young person coming into it, don't get ahead of yourself. You know, do, do the work first. You know, don't overspend. I always say that. I've said it a couple of times on your podcast, I believe. Don't overspend, you know. Do two jobs and work the training around um, as a second job and build it slowly. I mean, I, I have had gyms in the 80s, but when I started this, this recent incantation of this vital exercise thing, it was only, you know, we were doing five or six free workouts a week. I was lucky to have some money set aside so that I didn't suffer financially but i it, it was just graphs and time and referrals referrals and and another good tip is go to find local clubs a very good organization is the rotary club you should all you know if you're if you if you're opening a business seek out the rotary club unfortunately during these covid times they're not having meetings anymore but Generally, on a Tuesday throughout England, in nearly about every town and city in England, maybe two or three in some cities, Rotary Club have a Tuesday lunch. Make contact with that uh, Rotary Club in your area, and they have a, they like to have speakers at the lunch. So they, the, the ladies and gentlemen, they eat their lunch, and you get up and speak, and you would tell them about strength training. That's, that's exactly what I did. You know, after about three months, I didn't know anything about this. One of the Rotary Club worked on the estate where I work. She contacted me and said, would you like to to come to our lunch? Because they're desperate for speakers, you know. You know, what they're finding people to speak about stuff every Tuesday is very difficult. So I did. I went up and I spoke in front of about 150 people. I got one gentleman from that. And from that, love it. from that, I probably got 30 because he came in. I did a great job and he told everybody and then i went went to speak at the other rotary club in the same city and i got a couple from there and now i've got you know a, a lot of rotarians a lot of retired um people in their 60s and 70s that started created a nice core for my business and from that thanks to things like your podcast and various talking things it's just got it has grown and grown but it's taken 10 years plus it's not easy. It takes a long time. Don't, don't be in a hurry. Ten-year overnight success. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. This is such good advice. Um, do you know what I was just thinking? There is. Do you think with referrals, there's like a like a Pareto distribution? In other words, let's say you've got ten clients. There's like two clients who'll refer like eighty generate eighty percent of the referrals. Have you found that? Like, there's just some individuals that will, and so, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Some people just don't want to say anything. Okay. And I'll tell you why that is. It's because they don't want people coming in and still in their slot. Right. Yeah. Right. So that's a capacity thing. So if you yes. had, so let's say you had, you know, six trainers in a, your new studio or whatever, then that would no longer be an objection. Do you think that would no longer get in the way? Because yes. obviously there'd be, if, the, if you let's, I'm just saying for argument's sake, you're doing six workouts at once in that place. Then there's no longer that competition for slots, at least in the beginning anyway. You know. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's but, fascinating. I've heard that before, actually. And either, referrals either, are great. Go ahead. Sorry, referrals yeah. are great, but the, but but we used to discount. Uh, we'd go offer, you know, sessions free if we had a signed up referral. We don't do that anymore because I think we're cheap enough. We just say thank you, and we may give them a free workout if you know it's it, it worked very why, well. Why haven't you? I, I I do think you're cheap. Why haven't you raised your prices? We were thirty pound for eight years, and then I put it up to thirty-five. Okay, um, and we are very happy with the with the sixty pound for the doubles. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's my failing, really. I, you know, Lorraine says we're cheap. You listen to other trainers, and it, it's a failing on my behalf. I, I do need to do it. 
I really, I really respect your humility and vulnerability, actually, Ted, because you're not alone. I think there's a lot who, um, who, who are in that position. Um, and for what it's worth, I've t- it's on the tip of my tongue. So I'm just going to say because I think, I think a, this might help you, Ted, but it might help a lot of our listeners as well. Is um, and this is all all credit to Luke Carlson who shared with this with me ages ago. Um, he created some content in the membership, which is just called How to Raise Prices, and it's phenomenal. And um, one of the things I thought was really powerful was the idea that obviously you, you can't be raising prices all the time. You have to do it at set intervals, maybe every year or so. And the way he advised to do it is to explain in a succinct email to all your clients exactly what is changing that's going to give them increased value. And so it's, yeah. it's thinking about what are you changing to your business, your methodology, the way you deliver the service, their customer experience, their whole experience of your service, all of that. What can you ch- show materially in that email to justify that increase? So what you could do is say, increase it a 40 pound a session um, and, and have a, an email with like free bullets demonstrating what they're getting for that additional cost. And I know it's silly because you're, you're thinking, well, they already get 70 pounds of value, you know, whatever it is. Right. So why should I have to do that? But it's just a, maybe it's like a psychological thing, right? People want to see, oh, what am I getting extra for this additional investment? And that's why I think when you're, when people are, re- are way too cheap, that's a real problem because then it's quite hard to then increase that incrementally over time until you get to a price when it's actually going to be, you know, um, produce a, a more healthier business, right? A more yes. profitable business. Um, which is really important for keeping us in the game. Um, it's a reciprocal. Business ahead. is reciprocal. Yeah. And Luke's right, isn't he? Because it is reciprocal because you should always be offering something. You know, if you're going to put your price up, it should, it's reciprocal yes. for the for the client to, to um, receive something. And yes. um, it's like the equipment. We're adding equipment. Like we're in, in the existing gym, soon we're taking a uh, MedEx lumbar machine. And Nice. Um, it, you know that's that's not cheap. You know your older client's going to love that. Yeah, that's right. right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. it is important to be adding, and it's important to be adding to um, uh, the service as well. You know, but it's a a strange dynamic that um, that does that niggles me, and I know it niggles Lorraine because she's always. <laughs> She's always on about me to put the price to put the prices she's up, and I think business partner for you if she's that. Type yeah, of, if, if you she... kind of have that conflict, I think that's great. I think that's healthy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, let me. Yeah, I mean, just a very quick example, just to elaborate on that. Is so that email could literally be like, in fact, you made a really good point there, which is you should always be improving your service to your customers. You should always be trying to improve your business. Now, one of those points could be we've just invested in a MedEx lumbar extension, probably the. Uh, the best machine possible for isolating the muscles of the the, the lower back and and and, elim- and and mitigating any sort of back pain, right? Like that's a, that's an amazing sort of additional benefit to your business to your client. Um, but I, I remember one of the ones that I think Luke said was something about um, improving the uh, the career experience for their trainers. So it was some kind of like employee benefit or pension or something like that. And uh, one of the things he's always saying when he comes on the show is, is customers love to see you treat your staff really, really well. Um, because obviously they become very endeared to the trainers. They understand that the trainer is the business, it's everything. Uh, and so if you treat them very well, and that's going to go down really well. So there's, there's a couple of just tips there for Maybe for you, Ted, yeah, or for anyone great. listening, that they can yeah. use. And and Ted, we'll take this offline because I'll, I'll I'll send you something that will really help you with this. Um, so, and just to elaborate on what you said there about networking, the Rotary Club, that's a great idea. I love that. Um, we've joined BNI and we're having massive success through BNI, which is a similar networking group. Um, and funny, funny you should say that opportunities come out of networking that you never expect. Um, there's this really wonderful lady who's part of my networking group who um, owns a financial services business. And she has got this, um, she's participating in this event um, at this local organization. It might be a college. I can't remember off the top of my head. 
But there's likely to be about 150 people, similar to what you said, at this event. And I'm likely to have a slot there where I can speak about strength training and optimal strength. And so that's something I never anticipated, you know, when I joined this. But these are the kinds of things that happen, right? You show up, you give your best, and then these things happen. Um, so that's really exciting. And yeah, got, and also, yeah, sorry, to, also okay. and you, you, should, you should tailor your networking to your strength. So for me, um, I went to um, a two or three networking events where everyone's just shoved in a room having coffee and biscuits, and that's how you meet. I, I, I was, it was a d- dreadful. I hated it. Right, I'd never do that again. I hated it. I could not approach people, could not speak. Hi, my name's, oh, my God. So, <laughs> but what I can do is stand up in front of a couple of 300 people because I think it comes from being a, my, as I grew up as a kid, I used to do bingo calling, you know, for my parents. So I was always be able to stand up there and call bingo numbers. All right, love, sit down. And then I would, um, <laughs> and of course I did bodybuilding, you know, and if you can stand up in front of, you know, 500 people in your speedos, you can do anything. So my preferred way was to just stand up in front of a load of people and just speak about it because I can do that. But you need to find your strengths when you are networking, you know, think what, what would I like to do and how would I like to do it? Some kids, they're great, aren't they? Because they'd have, slideshows going off and PowerPoint presentations. Me, I was just waving my arms around and throwing my notes around. But the kids would be great at that. So find your strength, you know. Yeah, yeah I like that. Al- align your your marketing with what you enjoy, right? And your networking. Yeah. Um, Ted, I just want to make sure we we touch on, obviously, your expansion. So do you want to just give the listeners an update on what's happening there? When is the new studio going to be live? How do people get in touch to to, you know, if they want to book a free intro or they want to learn more, um, can you just give those, that information? Okay. Well, we're moving, uh, to, we're having a second location now. So we'll have two gyms. Uh, Vital Exercise 2 is in Brightland Sea um, on the marina, a beautiful location, looking over a marina with boats and uh, Lovely. It's, it's just, it's beautiful. Uh, and it's about 2,000 square feet. We're having, uh, probably have more uh prime equipment from the usa than with the with adjustable cams and anyone in the uk i think plate loaded not plate loaded sorry stack stack and pin so we'll have a lot of that and our um we're having a um a team of designers to design it because we're throwing everything at this and the the idea is to have one of the best boutique gyms in the country that's the idea and i know ticking the boxes we've got a lot of boxes ticked which i don't think anyone is, is going to be able to approach, certainly not the location, the quality of equipment and um, the expertise of the trainers that uh, I'll be bringing in. So that's our goal, to have one of the best boutique gyms in the country. Uh, people can get hold of us at uh, vitalexercise.com um, and you can contact me through there. You can book sessions. Um, our phone number is on there. Just give me a ring. Um, cause our, our second, our first location is just going on as normal, which is phenomenal awesome. little location. I think that's great that you are investing in some interior design. Um, I don't know if you uh, listen, uh, sorry, I recorded a podcast with Luke a while ago on, um, on, uh, reviewing their micro studio and how it compared to one of their larger locations, which has, you know, great interior design. And one of his conclusion was that he feels, sorry, one of his, the conclusions was that he feels that a, a larger, more beautiful location is likely to be easier to grow, generate more referrals. Um, so anyway, worth listening to that if people are interested in learning more about that, um, that, that you know, comparison and that, that conclusion from Luke. Um, Ted, thanks so much for taking the time today. Very well. Going to need to wrap it up there. And I certainly could talk to you all day and hopefully we'll do another one soon. Um, and for... Everyone listening, actually, no, I've got, yeah, so vitalexercise.com is the website, right? So that's where people can go learn more about you. I just want to very quickly mention Hit Business Membership, which I alluded to in this podcast. I talked about the content with Luke on how to raise prices, which is excellent and and an instant win if you're underpriced in your studio business. Um, And the reality is also that most strength training studio owners struggle to get more clients. Hit Business Membership provides how-to guides from successful studio owners so you can start to grow your business with confidence. And you can join now over at highintensitybusiness.com forward slash join. To find the blog post for this episode and all the things that Ted and I mentioned, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search for episode 
332. <laughs> and until next time, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>